thank you for inviting me to be part of the conference. Uh, so far, it's been pretty amazing to hear what everybody has to say. Uh, what you see here, interactive design activities as, you know, and authorship and architecture. I've tried to bring things down to make it more accessible, more uh, legible for you guys, because I think that design can sometimes be an anomaly from an educational path that, you know, is kind of void of being exposed to our process. But what I'd like to do is I see everybody in this room as kind of the future leaders in the community. And so understanding architecture and understanding my millennial approach to architecture and design, I think could help you be aware of what engaging an architect or uh, designer in the built environment could be. And I want to start by preferencing the fact that architecture, um, architecture means built environment, it means uh, design, it can, be, uh, it can be translated into pretty much every part of our life, right? So hopefully these principles aren't just uh, stuck to my field. So something that I want to start off with is the reality that only about 2% of the world's architecture is built by architects. And if we want to bring that more closer to home because that's global, uh, we could say that 2% of the United States residential projects are done by architects. And this is somewhat difficult for me to kind of get my hands around as I decide what my path is only a couple years out of school, a newly licensed architect. Um, and so I've been trying to say and figure out exactly how does something become more inclusive. You know, we have, we have a tendency to be a little bit more exclusive, hold people at an arm's length, and how do we make a better process? Uh, that begins with actually learning what the definition of an architect is. And I don't know, how many in this room have ever, raise your hand if you've ever engaged an architect, your parents have, you even know what one is? It's, yeah, that's great, that, that usually doesn't happen. Um, but the definition of an architect is a person who designs buildings and advises in their construction with the best interest of public health, safety, and welfare in mind. And something that we run into a lot is that the, the term architect has gotten distilled by a lot of other professions just to mean problem solver, right? Like you have an information architect, you have, you know, many different, you know, professions that have co-opted this term. But what's critical here is the idea of the best interest of public health, safety, and welfare. So, you know, just like this building, uh, designed by Perkins Will, we want to design something that's incredibly beautiful, that's something that you really want to go be in that space. Uh, but we also want to do something that is structurally sound, acoustically mindful, um, good indoor air quality. There's, there's so many components that come into it that distilling it just to a problem solver probably isn't enough. And so I want to start by kind of sharing what I see is the traditional relationship between a client and an architect. Uh, I see, you know, many of you probably being at this point in some case, you know, in some place in the future, whether it's as part of a board or as part of doing your own project. And in my mind, the traditional relationship is that a client comes to me with a program and a budget, and then I turn around and respond to that program and budget through design. Sometimes there's a back and forth that happens in there. Usually, um, usually there's a deliverable, and that deliverable, the client either says, I really like this, let's go forward, or they say, you know what, like the program and the budget are just off. We need to rework it and start from scratch. So when I say program, program means like things like if I'm doing a house, then I've got like a bedroom, so many bedrooms, so many bathrooms, whatever. Those are just things. They're not necessarily spaces that we create. So this, this program is a little bit one directional, just like, you know, just like a bad relationship at times. Um, and you know, what I'd like to propose is a more collaborative relationship in, we, in which the client and architect uh, actually generate the program, the budget, and the vision for the project together. And how do we do that? Well, we do it through things that I like to call interactive activities. Um, I have, uh, I've been licensed for only about a year, but over the last 10 years since finishing grad school, 
I've illustrated a number of books. I've worked with clients in actually designing projects and uh, do a lot of outreach through uh, different high school programs in the Cleveland area in which I've tried to explore how to become, you know, how do you invite people into feeling ownership of space? You know, you go to Case and this is the university center. You know, how much of that university center do you feel you own? How much of it do you feel if I just wanted to have my pajamas on on the day and go and study? So that's critical into creating experiential space, which I think is a major part of what we're hoping for in the design community. So I kind of create three different types of activities, right? So those that generate awareness, those that educate, and those that interact, right? So these can happen in any order, but for the sake of kind of making it a little bit simpler to digest, uh, we'll go through awareness, education, interaction with some uh, examples filtering in the background that I've uh, worked on over the past couple years. So awareness, architects, you know, I love slides, right? I love pictures uh, and I love to make diagrams. So this is kind of something that starts to distill uh, the ideas and the concepts of something that could be pretty complex. But awareness is the activity setting the trajectory for us to look outward. So, you know, in anything, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a project, we bring our own baggage along, right? Like sometimes we start off maybe not in the best position, you know, just like the client bringing a program that they probably haven't thought too much about. They just found it online or got it from a friend uh, at a different institution. And, you know, the activities that you'll see uh, that follow this are all about how do we start to look beyond ourselves? How does the architect and the designer start to allow people to become aware of the world around them and the opportunities to design? So one of the ways you can do that is by bringing the built environment to the public, right? Case has these beautiful buildings between the tank and uh, the Weatherhead School and many others. You know, how do we make it so that someone that lives on the other side of the county knows that these beautiful opportunities exist, not just about the school, but about the local architecture? Same with you guys being in proximity to MOCA. You know, there's lots of, lots of really good design things that at some point will rub off on you and will make you want to be in spaces like those. So this was a project that I, I, uh, I did. It's a publication actually nearing its third edition. Uh, it is an illustrated guide to the city for children, um, but also works for adults, right? Coloring books are huge now, so it gives us something to do when we relax. It allows us to learn about the buildings, learn about the location, and then go out into the public and actually visit these. So we could start to create our own experiences, start to understand design in a very interesting way. Something that's very difficult when you approach a design project is understanding what the deliverables are, like understanding the language, the vocabulary, just like a medical student, a biology student, anything like that. There's going to be this niche of kind of terms that maybe we feel foreign to. So how do we make those, tor those terms more accessible? How do we present people with something that, um, you know, they could understand the relationship of three-dimensional space and two-dimensional drawings. And these are activities that I use with students to, to kind of express, you know, scale and proportions, but then also like our perception of our environment, right? So, so it's about creating an awareness of what to expect when you walk into the front door uh, of a design firm. Another way we can do that is about talking about changing perspectives, right? We've, we've talked about that with with IAS Talk, with Yentl's, you know, our city and our spaces are three dimensional. And so helping people understand that, you know, as you move around an object, as you move around a city, you know, really everything about that space changes based on your point of reference. So this activity is about actually cutting out, coloring, cutting out, and recreating your own skyline. So this gives this gives people the opportunity to, one, reimagine the different viewpoints in the city, and then also to create something new and something generative, which starts to lead into the creative process. The next type is education. So these 
activities are basically a sponge, right? We've, we've looked outward and now we can come back in with all that new stuff that we found out in the community and you know, start to create what I would consider like an orbit or a trajectory uh, where the client and the architect and whoever else is involved are now speaking the same language, right? So at one point it was out of reach and then now hopefully it starts to get a little bit closer, but there's plenty of things that we, you know, regardless of field, need to understand um, how we can make it more accessible and one of the ways is educating. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with like uh, popular TV shows like HGTV. Uh, there's a show that my wife and I have watched a couple of times called Love It or List It, where you know someone will, a couple will approach a decorator or designer or whoever the host is, and that host will promise a whole bunch of things and say, I want to have open space, I want to have an extra bathroom, I want to have all of this stuff, and they promise them the world. And then halfway down the project they say, oh, we can't open up that wall because it's a load-bearing wall, or we can't, we can't actually give you the bathroom you want off of your bedroom because there's an old chimney in there or something, and it's supporting your roof, so you know, it might be an issue in taking that out. And you kind of go down a path where you lose a little, you get disheartened. So, Something we're checking out probably at the end of the school year is the Rooms de Let exhibition or art installations that are in Slavic Village. And what the uh, Cleveland Land Bank does with Slavic Village is they take four houses that are slated to be demolished and they give them over to artists. And artists can create something beautiful. And so what I did uh, a couple years ago was I took a stair and this stair was, was you know, the, the stair treads were gone in some cases, there were uh, walls exposed, jip board. The outlets were kind of hanging out in space. And what I wanted to do is to use it as an opportunity to educate people about their homes. Right? I, my wife and I bought a home last, uh, last year in Lakewood. We had to learn a lot, even though I'm an architect, about things that we don't do anymore, such as knob and tube wiring and you know different types of electrical service. You guys would be surprised, but just because you look at an outlet and it's grounded doesn't mean it's actually tied to you know, a ground fault or something like that. So, so what I did was I, I created all of these, uh, all of these you know, cutouts at the, uh, you know, over here at the Think Box and basically tagged them on walls, tagged them on you know, surfaces. And as people were walking around the space, they could uh, they could actually learn a little bit more about if their house was built in a certain period of time, what are the things they could expect, what are the things they can do to make their, their environment safer and better and beautiful. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, like we've talked about language, um, it's one thing to understand a language, it's another thing to actually teach people to speak that language with you. And so a lot of the outreach I like to do is about teaching people how to draw about teaching people how to understand. So when you're in meetings with, with clients or with faculty or whatever down the road, you know, it's one thing for you always to be active in drawing and taking notes and whatever, but it's another thing when you can actually get the people that you're working with to kind of do the same. So that it's this continuous collaborative relationship uh, in which people are being active. Um, an activity that I do a lot with, uh, with students is understanding how we see or perceive the world. You know, there's, there's so much depth to things, whatever they are, right? Whether it's this room and understanding, you know, how you have a, a, a pitch surface and this projector just somehow magically hangs down in space, right? So, you know, there's, there's levels of thought that go into things that if I sit someone down and say you have 10 minutes to draw something and they, you know, someone's gonna draw every single line that exists, right? Like this is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The second time around, they get half the amount of time. It's like a little bit more distilled, and a little bit more distilled, and then finally, you give someone a minute, and all of a sudden, you get what we call a diagram, right? So a diagram in this case is a perspective, but in other cases, it, it's like bubble diagrams, stuff like that, right? Where you're actually distilling something very complex into the essential the essential line work you need to communicate that thing. 
And so these are critical for our, our work. And once people understand them, it's easier for them to generate their own. Uh, this is a new one I'm working on for uh, a book that I'm going to re release within the next week or two. This is uh, Mocha Cleveland. So buildings are three-dimensional, right? This building is really, really interesting because of how it creates space, right? How it creates the field, you know, the space for the field, the space for the outdoor, uh, you know, amphitheater. And so helping people understand that two-dimensional things can be folded and generate three-dimensional representations of form goes a long way into helping people visualize space because we have to draw things in two dimensions in order to communicate with someone building something. But probably nobody in this room, including myself, learned to understand space any way other than three-dimensionally. And so, you know, there's something about starting to bring people into that orbit and then allowing them to actually play. You know, I think something that I've had trouble with as a millennial is to understand that, you know, business can be fun and we can have a lot of fun with our clients and we can make them, um, we can make them want to have the kind of fun we have all the time and they keep coming back. So the last is, is interaction. And this is the activity as a conduit for design enabling authorship. So authorship is critical in that every single project that you have someone do, it's custom, right? A house is custom no matter who makes it, um, but it's not always your own. And how do we have a process in which you become the author of your space? You know, it's like uh, the first mode I talked about traditional being the architect driven client ex you know exclusive versus the architect led and client inclusive which i think is probably the uh, the best for having a space that you truly enjoy one of the major parts of work is something called programming right so programming like i said about a house is actually understanding how spaces relate to each other and this is a board game i put together for a client working on a uh, an old strip mall and Essentially what it is is saying, Here's, here are the programs that you told me you wanted, right? And then here they are to scale. Here's a board to play with. Here's a design guide to kind of help you make some decisions. And then why don't we play a little bit, put them on the site. And after we do that, we can figure out how much maybe this will cost. You know, because garages are super, super expensive and really big. And when you have opportunities like this where the garage can go underneath a grassy area, it makes a whole lot of space in an urban situation. Now, I also have a background as an urban designer, um, and I absolutely love public space. And so what is it where you start to take things and make them more accessible on you know, a network level, right? So, what if I were just to have an open source guide to creating a public space in four easy steps? And so this is something that we put together just to say, if you want to author your own, you know, your own backyard, if you want to author your own, you know, neighborhood park, then there's a couple of easy steps you can take to actually make that happen. This one's a little more, little more complicated, but a lot more fun. I love the fun colors. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, read Choose Your Own Adventure style books uh, when you were younger. Yeah, no? Uh, so this is a design guide for people to create their own library. And it actually makes people aware of a process that a library no longer has to be something grand. It can be as simple as uh, a bench with Wi-Fi. You know, like looking at, looking at the different things, exposing them to people, not saying that the project I'm giving you is only based on a budget, but you know we can make certain decisions together, and those decisions can yield something that's incredibly fun and liberating, but also uh, you know gives us a, a beautiful guide to go back and and kind of take a look at what our priorities are. And then uh, I'll finish up the last example with this project I just led in my office uh, earlier this year. It's called HomeKit, but Essentially what it is, is, is it takes toys and it starts to use them as a building system on a grander scale. And so there was a toy called Constructs. You guys may be a little too young to remember, but it was more like in the 80s. 
uh, it was kind of a rival to Legos, and using the idea of these building components that can be assembled in a variety of different ways to address mobility, to address changes in scale, uh, to address you know refugees, you know whatever, so that we could we could then follow maybe how a building can change and be authored by a person over the story of their entire life. And looking at how, like you look at uh, um, the architectural responses to disaster relief after like Hurricane Katrina and in Haiti, you know, these are really starting to be ways in which, just like Ikea came out with their own refugee uh, kit a couple, I think it was last year, you know, how people can really start to be engaged in their built environment. And to me, these are the things that I want to make sure, I want to expose as many people as I can to because at some point in time, you're going to be at a point where you can decide what kind of process you want to have. So what's next? Obviously, there's these, so there's these three types. I do lots of stuff, right? I'm, I need to continue to develop the activities for outreach, for publication, for use with my clients. Um, I think that as millennials, we'll conti I'll continue to understand what collaboration truly means. I think there are generations ahead of me in which collaboration was just some kind of fancy term we used to say we get in a, a lot of people in the same space. Uh, but really, it's about everybody becoming a voice and that voice being heard in some constructive way. Now, for you guys, what I'd like is to think about it and when you get to a point where you can work on a project and you get to a point where, whether it's as a board, as an individual, as a family member, you know, or on some reality TV show that you decide to uh, just up and go on for HGTV, that you want an inclusive process that allows you to really make a difference in your own environment. Thank you.